Hi everyone, I'm Matt from THKP, and this video is going to be the first in a series about building a simple game that's a bit like Candy Crush using Flutter and its implicitly animated widgets. As you can see, users can swipe up and down or left and right to move the columns and rows around. Whenever the user makes a string of three or more of a particular color, those boxes disappear and the whole thing collapses inwards towards the center. Alright, let's get into it. Okay, so we're basically starting with the basic Flutter Create app that they, they start you off with. We have the My App, My Homepage, as I'm assuming you're familiar. And so in our build method, we just have very simple. So we've got a scaffold. We're centering the content of the scaffold. We're going to need to receive user input. As you saw from the example before, the user needs to be able to swipe to move the columns and rows. So we're going to need to implement on pan start, on pan update, and on pan to end at some point. And then finally, we'll have our stack, which is kind of where the rubber meets the road in terms of drawing these boxes to the screen. So you might be thinking, oh, well, it's all made up of rows and columns anyway, so why not just construct it using row and column widgets? And I have to admit, I didn't actually go down this path of implementation, but my understanding is it would involve a lot of, of shuffling in terms of which box should be in which row and what have you, and it would make certain animations slightly more difficult in my assessment. If you do try this out and you manage to make that work, I would definitely be super interested to see how you got that working. But in our case, we're just going to be using uh, a stack. So, And then we have our stack children here, which is above, and it's just a red container. So let's uh, take a look at what that looks like right now. Unsurprisingly, a red uh, squircle, you know, we've got our border radius on the box. So that's that's what we're starting off with. So we're basically going to build up our grid of boxes up from this, this one lonesome box here. So we're going to need a grid of boxes. And um, before we can create that grid, I think what we're going to need to do is create a representation of the game world the world space. If you've seen any of our videos before, you know we're proponents of having this well-defined world space and a well-defined screen space and translating between the two. So I think the first thing that we should do is create a, a game box class which is going to hold the information about the world space for one of the boxes on the screen. So, uh, so let's start making that class and we're going to have a location which is going to be an offset. We're going to have a color, just a color, and we're going to have a get rect function, which is where we do that translation between the logical world and the screen space. So let's let's just add that function. And in order to return this, we can we need to know how big the screen size is. So we'll uh, accept the size, and let's add an implementation for get rect. So up above, we've defined some constants here. So we have something called relative gap size. All the columns and rows have gaps between them. And this is how we define how big those uh, gaps are relative to how big the boxes are. And then grid size is just how many tiles big the grid should be on the shortest side. So we will say double total box width equals screen size dot shortest size, which is a useful little handle for whichever side is shorter on this device and then we'll just divide that by the grid size and now we'll use the lock to figure out where the bounds of this uh, rect should be so I think we'll be able to use one of the rect construction functions rect from center okay so here we have a decision to make about how the world coordinates map onto the screen coordinates. In this case, I've decided to say, okay, the center of the screen is going to be 0, 0, kind of like a Cartesian plane. Uh, y is going to be increasing up, so, you know, negative Y is going to be down, negative X is going to be to the left, and positive X is going to be to the right. So if lock is 0, 0, the center is going to be screen size divided by 2, and so we'll say offset screen size dot uh, width divided by two and then screen dot 
height divided by two as well. And so now this is the center. And then in order to figure out actually where the box will lie, we will say that this lock is in terms of kind of a unit sized grid. So one unit is one box. And then in addition, we'll have all of the boxes centered on kind of half units. So the center is zero, zero, and then all the boxes around it are at 0.5 aligned values. We will say plus lock dot dx times total box width. And then here we want to do it in the y direction, lock dot dy times total Shuffle this code a little bit. Okay, and it's complaining because we still have some required parameters for this. Too many positional arguments. So, right. and so this is center, and then there'll be a height, and then a width. These are easy. These are the total box. Let's actually uh, start to re-implement our current scene in terms of this box and make sure that we're seeing the right thing. So instead of these values, we're going to create a game box. We'll just use the builder values to set these. Lock equals offset zero zero. And then dot dot color equals uh, color spot red. And then what we'll do is we'll grab the screen size now, we'll wrap this in a position so we can place it precisely. And then, generally, the way that I do this is I will say rect equals, and top is going to be game box rect dot top. Uh, left is going to be game box. And we pull the height and width off the game box width as well. Uh, so we will get rid of these. Container should uh, try to fill the space, so it should inherit the size from the position. We will take color off of the game box. Okay. And we see our red squircle again. And just as a test that this is actually working, we will change this to say, let's say 12, just to make it really obvious. Oh, uh, wow. Okay, and now it's, now it's a little circle because of the border radius, but let's put it back to six. Next, I think it'll make sense to pull some of this logic to, uh, for drawing the box to the screen into its own game box widget, which will accept the game box and it'll actually draw it to the screen. So let's do that. This is going to be a stateless widget, so I'll use one of the uh, useful snippets from an extension that I have called Awesome Flutter Snippets. I find it pretty useful just to give a head start, so we'll call this game box widget. This is going to accept a game box. So we will add a final game box box parameter and we will say this dot box and now we can basically just copy the code for our position from below plop it into our build method okay and instead of our positioned here we will uh, use our, our game box widget and we will pass in box Okay, and then this should look the same. Exciting. So let's just, again, let's change something just to confirm. And our box turns green. So now we have our uh, game box widget. And this will make it easier for us to just create a list of these game boxes and then we can pass them all into these game box widgets. So this will be a useful handle for us when we're uh, building our game board. 
So now let's generate our quote unquote game board. And that is just gonna be stored as a list of game boxes on our homepage state. So, so game box boxes. And we'll create a method that generates the game boxes. Okay, so we uh, are creating our list of game boxes. We start from negative two and a half while it's less than positive two and a half. We continue and then we just generate all of the uh, game boxes, add them to result, and then we return that. So let's call this when we're, we'll just say that this is boxes.map b arrow game box. Okay, so we map our list of boxes to uh, game box widgets and we make sure that it's a list and we don't need this box anymore. Okay, now we have our grid of red boxes. We have an off by one error where this should be allowed to be less than uh, or equal to. And since it is state, we need to refresh. Okay, so we've got our full grid of boxes. We can see that we're not drawing that gap. We will say gamebox.height times one minus gap. What we can do is put a padding around this container and then And then we say uh, game box rect dot width times relative gap size. And then this can be divided by two. Basically we want a grid gap of uh, relative gap size, but we only want to do half that size gap on any particular side. Next, right, so now we're getting our gappy grid and so uh, this is this is pretty unexciting right now. Uh, any move would just instantly disappear the whole uh, grid. So let's start to generate some colors. First off, we will we'll just make a list of. You know, let's make this a const list. And then we will need a random integer well we'll just say random r equals and this will be colors sub r dot next int okay and we will need to refresh again All right, and now we are getting this colorful grid of boxes. If you think back to the original example, the way that it worked is if you have three colors in a row, it should disappear. So right now we're generating grids that start with three in a row, which is confusing from a user's perspective. It's like, does, what, how do I get those boxes to disappear? So we'll want to generate a grid that doesn't have any contiguous regions. That's what we will do next. So we are going to need to update our generate game boxes function. So let's go up to that. And at a high level, the way this is going to work, and actually I'll switch over to another visualization to kind of explain how this is going to work. So let's say hypothetically we've generated these following grid squares that we now want to pick a color for this new box right the way this is going to look is we will look 
to the left of that square and we will look to the square above it because we're, we're not concerned about diagonal relationships. It's okay if it's the same as these ones diagonally. The main thing we're concerned about is boxes adjacent on the top and on the sides and on the bottom. So, so we look to the left, we look to the top, we make sure we're not the same as those. And then at that point we say, okay, well, we can't be yellow, we can't be blue. So the remaining possible colors are red and green. And then we randomly select from those remaining colors. So that's kind of at a high level how we're gonna do that. So let's go back to code. And so in our method here, we are just gonna iterate all of the boxes we've generated so far. And then we'll look for the boxes that are to the left and to the top. And then when we see those boxes, we'll remove those boxes from the candidate colors. So first we'll construct this quote unquote candidate colors list from the existing colors list that we already have. And this is just a shorthand for making a clone of the colors list. So we're checking that the box that we're looking at has the same X location. That means that they're all in the same column. And then we just want to look at the box that's immediately above it. So it has a location of Y minus one. And then we'll remove that color. And then actually we want to uh, look in the other case where it's in the same row, but it's one to the left. So we'll add that case. Okay, so we should be constructing candidate colors correctly now, and we just need to update down here that we select the color randomly from candidate colors instead of our fixed uh, colors list. So <laughs> we have a minor uh, minor logic error. We are anding all of these, these logical operations together and we should be doing or. This is a minor thing. This gets into the precedence of these operations. We know that and is evaluated before ors, but I just always like to be explicit in these cases and wrap these components in parentheses just to make it very clear what is getting evaluated first. Okay, so if we take a look at our app, we can see that we have successfully generated a grid without any contiguous color regions. And now we're going to get into some more interesting stuff. We're actually going to add the ability to interact with these rows and columns. So we're going to put our gesture detector to use, but just to, just to break down this problem at a high level for how we're going to address this, the general approach is going to be when the user taps, we figure out which box they're tapping on. Then we grab the corresponding column and row for that box. And then if they drag more in the Y direction, we're gonna start sliding the whole column. And if they drag more in the X direction, we're gonna start moving the row. So let's get into it. So now we are going to start to implement these on pan star functions. Uh, I think the first thing that we are going to need to do is create a function or method that takes a tap coordinate and gives us which underlying box that tap coordinate corresponds to. So let's add that. So we will just add this at the top here. Okay, so we'll say game box get tapped box. Okay, so we are getting our rect for each one of these boxes and we want to see if it contains the tapped coordinate. So we're going to need to pass that into this method.
And if the rect contains that those global chords, we can just return that box. And then otherwise, we're just going to return null. Uh, and now we will call this from on pan start. And the eagle eyed monks, you may have noticed that we added a couple of these, these state variables. So we are going to hold on to which box the user tapped. And we're also going to hold on to what location they tapped at. So we'll set those now. I think for right now, our goal should be to get it so that we can just drag one square around. So on update, we will move our box around. And now I think it makes sense for us to add a little bit of state to our box. So the box will hold on to where the box started before the user started dragging it around. And that'll be useful if we need the box to snap back to where it was before the user started tapping. So, so let's go up and add that. Okay, and we'll just make sure to set start lock as the offset when we're creating our game boxes here too. So we have our tapped box, we have our tapped location. The, these drag update details are gonna give us the new global position. So we will update our tapped box's location. And since we're gonna uh, be updating state that affects the way the view is drawn, we will call set state. So we are calculating the delta as the current global position minus where the uh, tap started. So that just gets us the uh, delta between the start of the tap and drag and the, the current location. And now there's another important detail that we need to make sure uh, we get right here is that this, this, these coordinates are in screen space. And so in order for us to set that into the box, that box lock is in you know, world space, game, game space. So we just need to make sure that we are dividing by the size of the box before we do this. So I think the easiest thing to do would be to create a game box and say get wrecked. Doesn't matter what color or where it is, so we can just create a vanilla game box and then we'll say screen size. And so uh, this is getting a little messy. So we get the size of the screen. We use that to get the rect, and then we get the width of the rectangle. And so we divide that by the, you know, divide the this vector by the length of this, uh, or the width of that rectangle. And the reason why that works is because one box translates into one unit so the width of the box is is kind of one unit width in the world so but let me let me pull this out so that it's like slightly neater we may need this in the future so i'm also gonna pull out this game box so we'll just say wrecked game box wrecked Just a quick note that we need to initialize lock to something on the box, even though uh, we're only trying to get the size of the box. So let's bring the app back and see, because this should allow us to drag around boxes. All right, so now we have our draggable box. So to avoid making a two hour long video, I'm going to end this one here. In our next video, we're going to continue the implementation of dragging the rows in columns, and we're going to show you how to detect and remove streaks of three or more colored boxes. 
I hope you will join us for the next installment of this series. Thanks for checking out this tutorial and keep an eye out for future videos from THKP. If you found this useful, give us a thumbs up. And if you're interested in seeing more, don't hesitate to subscribe.